Hi, everyone, and thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Ethan Boll. I'm a comparative literature major at Princeton University. And today I want to talk a little bit about reality and film. So when I was in high school, I watched La La Land for the first time. Now, until that point, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. But afterwards, I started thinking more and more about making movies. I wanted to see the lights, feel the romance of Hollywood, and maybe one day see my name on the screen. Now, I'm not trying to sound too basic, but hey, if Top Gun could recruit a whole generation of naval aviators, then La La Land can get me to move to LA. Film shapes our perceptions. While we may think about reality in film or reality in art as two, they're deeply intertwined. Which is why when I was asked to present about the Midwest, despite having never been there before, I turned to movies, specifically Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Over the Hedge. Now, before I dig into these films, I need to answer the question that I'm sure is on many of your minds. How are these two farcical comedies any metric for studying the Midwest? Well, actually, film scholars use movies as a lens for studying reality all the time. And historians are increasingly doing the same thing. Robert Toplin, a film scholar, wrote in his book that historians have examined the ways in which themes developed in the movies sometimes reveal or verify shifts in the public's interests, hopes, fears, and prejudices. And the practice of using cultural artifacts like movies to explain or understand history is a common historiographic practice, which anyone who has taken the AP US history test can confirm. It also just makes sense that art is reflective of the culture in which it was made. You know, when we study Greece, we often start with the Odyssey and the Iliad. When I studied ancient Rome as a Latin student, we started with the Aeneid and the Metamorphoses. The cultural force of America today is movies. So it makes sense to study ourselves through the cinematic lens. So if film can tell us about the society in which it was made, what can film tell us about the Midwest? Now it's time for Ferris Bueller and Over the Hedge. These are two very different movies. One is an adult comedy from 1986 that was a smash hit at the box office, and the other is a wholesome animated DreamWorks flick from 2006. Both films, though, are set in the Midwest, and they present similar negative commentaries on Midwestern life. They both characterize the Midwest as a society whose priorities are out of order. In Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the film paints a picture of 1980 Chicago society that is ruled by the economy, materialism, and material gain. One that is supposedly built on Reaganite family values, but which sees the family unit mocked, absent, or too busy to pay attention to each other. In Over the Hedge, the backdrop is an Indiana suburb that focuses entirely on humans' wants and desires, consumerism, excess, and waste, all at the expense of the environment. Now, for those of you who haven't seen it or saw it in 1986, Ferris Bueller's Day Off is a comedy about a high school senior, Ferris, who fakes being sick to get out of school on a beautiful day. He drags his hypochondriac friend Cameron along for the ride, as well as his girlfriend Sloane. He consistently dodges the Dean of Students' efforts to catch him playing hooky. He scams the Mater D at a fancy restaurant. He hijacks a parade. And in the end, he teaches Cameron to stand up to his father. And all of this is set against the backdrop of 1980 Chicago. Take a look at this scene at the Chicago Stock Exchange. You want to get married? Sure. Today? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I'm not getting married. <laughs> why not? Why do you mean, why not? Think about it. Well, no. Besides being too young, having no place to live, you feeling a little awkward about being the only cheerleader with a husband. Give me one good reason. Why not? I'll give you two good reasons why not. My mother and my father. They're married and they hate each other. You've seen them, am I right? So what? Well, it's like that car. He loves the car. He hates his wife. All right. I love that scene. So this scene alone gives a rich description and critique of Chicago life. 
It's ruled by the stock exchange and materialism takes priority over the family. By placing a conversation about marriage in the same physical space as the Chicago Stock Exchange, this scene pits the two main values of Reagan's America against each other, family and the economy. And here is where film verifiably mirrors reality. Ronald Reagan ran his campaign and won the presidency by promising a restoration of family values, deregulation of business, and fiscal conservancy. While the stock market did boom in the 80s, the wealth gap also ballooned, and it became more profitable for companies to buy and sell stocks than to actually run productive businesses. And while Reagan won the religious conservative vote by championing family values, divorce rates only declined marginally, and he himself was the first president ever to have been divorced. The film keys into those shortcomings of American society by showing us Cameron, the boy in the hockey jersey, mimicking the hand motions of the stockbrokers. It's a funny bit, but it also illustrates what a strange and somewhat meaningless act trading stocks amounts to. And while material gain is shown as a lively and dynamic enterprise, it's also the very force that fractures the family unit or at least Cameron's. So even though the 80s were touted as the age of family values and economic success, the movie questions how valuable those values really were. Is the economy really a success if the rich get richer while middle-class wages stagnate for 40 years? Are lower divorce rates really better for the family if you have a father who hates his wife and loves his car? What really matters in Midwestern American life? And what kind of reality are we creating for ourselves? Over the Hedge presents a similar critique, although the social commentary in that movie is much more pronounced than in Ferris Bueller. Over the Hedge is about a raccoon named RJ who convinces a group of foraging animals to steal food from humans so that he can pay back an angry bear. Here is the scene in which RJ introduces the animals to suburbia. The homeowner's charter, which you signed, says the grass is supposed to be two inches, and according to my measuring stick, yours is 2.5. Could we just get the food and go? Really? Do they have it or not? Didn't you see it? It was in the box. They've always got food with them. We eat to live. These guys live to eat. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The human mouth is called a pie hole. The human being is called a couch potato. That is the device to summon food. That is one of the many voices of food. That is the portal for the passing of the food. That is one of the many food transportation vehicles. Humans bring the food, take the food, ship the food, they drive the food, they wear the food. That gets the food hot. That keeps the food cold. That, I'm not sure what that is. Ah! Ah! What do you know? Food! That is the altar where they worship food. That's what they eat when they've eaten too much food. That gets rid of the guilt so they can eat more food. Food, 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 food! So, you think they have enough? Well, they don't. For humans, enough is never enough. <gasps> and what do they do with the stuff they don't eat? They put it in gleaming silver cans just for us. All right, that is, that's enough. Uh, so the social commentary here is pretty clear. With humans, enough is never enough. But in this society, what happens to the things that really matter? Well, the humans cut down an entire forest to build a housing development. Gladys, the president of the Homeowners Association, reprimands another human for her grass being a half inch too tall. And when she finds out that animals have been foraging in her garbage, she calls an exterminator to dispose of them, and this is a quote from later in the movie, as inhumanely as possible. This society is overly indulgent, out of touch with nature, and consumed by outward appearance. So Ferris Bueller and Over the Hedge paint some pretty scathing pictures of Midwestern life. We know that film reflects the society in which it was made, but what does that mean practically? Does it even matter what Hollywood thinks and produces about the Midwest? Does that mean that the Midwest has to entirely revamp itself before Hollywood is kind to it? Yes and no, because not only does film reflect reality, film shapes reality. In his book, The Reality of Film, Richard Rushton writes, movies are a part of our lives. They form one aspect of how we live our lives, of how we choose to spend our time, and perhaps even from time to time, they may influence the decisions we make about our lives. 
For years, science fiction has accurately predicted and maybe even caused technological advancements. The science fiction of today is the science fact of tomorrow. And in his book, The Rise of the Creative Class, sociologist and economist Richard Florida posits that in the modern age, more young people move to cities based on their cultural vibrance and find a job after rather than the other way around. Now more than ever, the perceptions surrounding a city have tangible social and economic effects. And in the modern age, popular perceptions are largely crafted by the movies. Let's do an exercise. This is Los Angeles. Now I've never been to Los Angeles, but this picture is giving me a standard, somewhat boring city. This picture is flat, it's industrial, the colors are almost all washed out. It reminds me of driving through Hartford, Connecticut on 495. Now this is Los Angeles in La La Land. This is the reason why I wanna to move to LA. This picture has depth. It makes the human subject part and parcel of the landscape. It almost looks painted with deep blues and purples. This picture highlights beauty. The former highlights ugliness. The Midwest does not need to change for Hollywood to find the beauty that's there. Take a look at Hoosiers, the feel good sports flick from 1986, the same year as Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It's set in the tiny hick town of Hickory, Indiana. It certainly doesn't shy away from placing insular, provincial, and outdated thinking on screen, but it also manages to find the beauty and the value in small town Midwestern life. Take a look at this still from a scene where the protagonist and his love interest take a walk through the fields. This can be the beauty of the Midwest. Sure, the barn is falling apart and the sky is gray, but the picture is still beautiful. It has depth, the color scheme is naturalistic and simple, and the human subjects blend in as if they belong in the picture. The dilapidated barn and leafless trees don't matter because those things are trivial. It's a bucolic oasis where human connection trumps outward appearance. Now imagine that kind of imagery in other genres. What would a hero quest story that highlights the beauty of the Midwest look like? What about a romantic musical set in small town Ohio? What about Night at the Toledo Museum of Art? What if we could change the reality of the Midwest by changing how it's characterized in the movies? It's up to artists to find the beauty, the romance, the intrigue in Midwestern life, just as much as it's up to the Midwest to provide a source of inspiration and a set of ideas about what the Midwest really stands for. So the next time you go to the movies, think to yourself, how much of this film reflects my reality or how much of my reality <clears throat> Or how can I better change my reality to reflect the world of the film? And when art and life dynamically borrow, lend, mirror, and shape each other, the result is nothing less than changing the world. Thank you.